Uh, the three largest users of the pink ribbon label on cosmetics, Avon, Estee Lauder, and Revlon, remain unwilling to sign a pledge to remove carcinogens like parabens, toluene, and benzene from their products. This is why uh, it really bothers me when I see you know, the pink ribbons or the pink shoes on the NFL players or the pink bats in the major league or something like the successful manipulation of breast cancer awareness has allowed companies to slap the pink label all over the place, even when in some cases they're actually using products that have carcinogenic ingredients. There's a term for it, you've probably heard it, it's called pink washing. Pink washing. Put a pink ribbon on it and you're okay. People will think, you know, they're looking at a product and say, oh, I'd like to support breast cancer. They buy that product, turn around and use it, and it's got problematic ingredients in it. And then there's my own uh, particular pet peeve, which is uh, lawn chemicals. Now, I don't know about here in Florida. I'm guessing it's similar to where I live. Uh, every spring, you will turn on the TV or pick out, you know, see ads in the newspaper pushing uh, perfectly green monoculture grass. And it's funny, uh, they're usually ads with lots of really pretty white kids. Um, there's all kinds of subliminal messaging going on here, which we could spend a lot of time talking about. So lots of kids, lots of babies, lots of pets on these lawn care ads. And what they'll say is spray, 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 fertilize, fertilize, fertilize. So let's think about lawns for a minute. How much lawn is there in the United States? There's 50 million acres of grass, which is about the size of Nebraska. Now, you might say, well, that's not bad. That's you know, only one of 50 states. Everything else is cool, right? Well, I don't know about you, but like, I grew up having to mow a tiny lawn in New York, and I wouldn't want to mow Nebraska you know, once a week. You know, it's all right, Sunday morning, son, time to go out and mow Nebraska. Uh, you know, if you think about what it would take to maintain a really healthy lawn in Nebraska, it would take a lot of chemicals. Because what does a lawn want to be when it grows up? A lawn wants to be a forest, right? A lawn, everything wants to progress. In order to keep that lawn from becoming a forest, what you have to do is you have to mow it and you have to spray it. 50 million acres. It's a lot of grass and a lot of pesticides and a lot of fertilizer, which is a whole nother question. But it's not just our home lawns. We spray our schools, our colleges, our hospitals. You'll see stories about some of these lawn care companies saying things like, um, we will donate a new scoreboard to your school if you give us your, lawn, your, your um, groundskeeping contract. And, you know, schools have no money, right? This is one of the big problems. That no schools have any money anymore. So they say, sure, we need a scoreboard. So you get a scoreboard, and then you get these guys up and down spraying the school grounds. Uh, interesting how some of this stuff shows up. You'll find veterinarians saying it's, we've seen this uptick in lymphomas in, in uh, dogs and cats. Where's that coming from? And the theory is that dogs and cats roll around in the grass and they cover their entire body with these chemicals. We, you know, we walk around and cover the bottoms of our shoes. Interestingly, though, you can find these lawn chemicals inside your house because you're tracking them in, right? But a, a dog or a cat is rolling around and getting their whole bodies covered. Uh, they did a study in Denver where they showed that kids who grew up in yards that were treated with pesticides were four times more likely to develop soft tissue tumors than kids whose yards were not treated. You've heard a little bit about this, I know. Fertilizers and pesticides, you know, like once it rains, we spray all this stuff all over the place, and then it rains, right? Where does it all go? It all goes, all goes away, right? It's off, it, it disappears downstream. It rains, it goes down into your street, goes down into a sewer, goes down into a river. And if you live in Maryland, it goes into the Chesapeake Bay. If you're here, it goes into the Gulf of Mexico, right? You heard, if you were at the GMO talk earlier, you hear about these things called hypoxic dead zones. What this mainly is in, in uh, most of these bays is a product of these fertilizers running off of farms and running off of family yards you know, what does a fertilizer do? It stimulates plant growth. So all these fertilizers run into the bay, and all the algae goes bananas, right? It's suddenly got this enormous supply of food. Algae goes crazy, grows, and then it all dies, because algae doesn't live very long. And as it dies, the decomposition of that algae sucks all the oxygen out of the water. So this is a picture of the Chesapeake Bay in August in what's called a dead zone. You see all that algae there on the top? That wasn't there before. Fertilizer runs off, that algae goes boom, 
and then it dies, and then all the oxygen in the water gets sucked out during decomposition. That means there's no oxygen in the water. So there is nothing living in the water, nothing. Not a crab, not a fish, not a plant, nothing. And when you hear about the Gulf of Mexico, you hear about the Chesapeake, you hear like off the coast of San Diego, where, wherever there's big runoff from these big, big um, farm and subdivision areas, you find gargantuan dead zones. So this is what it looks like, right? So you have fertilizer on this farm, or if this is your yard and you've sprayed all these, things, all these chemicals, it rains, it all runs right off. That's, you need to multiply that by 50 million acres of lawn and you know, X number of acres of, of farms, and you're talking about massive collateral damage to the use of these chemicals. This is environmental stuff, I realize, but you know, that's also our drinking water. I guess I don't have to make that too plain. right? Where do you think our drinking water comes from? Right? This is where it comes from. So there's a, an algae bloom in Lake Erie. There's an algae bloom in, the, bloom in the Gulf of Mexico. From space, right? From space. Oh, and then, so then there's the artificial turf thing. I, this has kind of been evolving over the last couple of months. This is a fascinating thing. I, I have to say, even though I wrote this book, I never predicted this. There are 10,000 artificial turf fields in the United States. So what does you ever think about what artificial turf is made out of? Now, I don't even actually know what the grass is made out of. But underneath it, the black stuff that it's made on is made out of recycled tires. The Synthetic Turf Council will tell you that it keeps 20 million used tires out of the landfill every year, which is a good thing. 20 million tires. But what are tires made out of? Tire dust, that is to say the stuff of bro breaking down tires, contains heavy metals. Carcinogens like butylated hydroxyanosol and other severe irritants. Uh, the reason this story got some attention was that the University of Washington's varsity women's soccer coach started just hearing stories about soccer players in Division I soccer that had cancer. And according to her very unscientific study, there were 38 players that had cancer and 34 of them were goalies. And she said, I wonder why that is. And she started to speculate. I mean, granted, this is not scientific, but you know, a lot of stuff that science ends up getting to is, is generated initially by folklore, by stories, by people telling people things. She said, well, I wonder if it's because goalies spend all this time rolling around on this synthetic turf. Now try this, the next time it's your kids or your grandkids' soccer game, Go kick your foot on the synthet synthetic turf and just see what happens. You can actually generate like clouds of this black dust. I mean, I, you, it's very easy to do, but of course none of us ever thought to do it. So, because we replaced our small farms with large suburban homes, we now depend for our food on industrial agribusiness run by fewer and fewer companies. You know this, right? We've already hear been hearing about this. So these big companies mow down the small family farms. Farms are sold out to create subdivisions. GMO crops, right? We've already been hearing about this. Here they come, right? So now you've got all these farms out in the Midwest, and these crops, these seeds are developed by the same companies that make the pesticides, so now they can sell both seeds and pesticides, and they've got the whole thing figured out. <laughs> the urging of chemical companies, industrial farms have become increasingly chemical dependent. Right? This stuff is now so common that we don't even think to question it. Just a half dozen companies really control our food supply. So uh, you've been hearing a little bit about this too, but inside the EPA, the FDA, the USDA, all the agencies that regulate our food, as you probably know, all these places are essentially overseen by political appointees that, depending on who is in the uh, White House, tend to be very industry friendly. So I don't know if you know this, but like these, these agencies have like this kind of glass barrier between the scientists who are there, no matter who's in the White House, and the political positions that, are, that change whoever comes in, right? So you have a business-friendly administration. Those guys you know, occupy the top administrative posts. So as the science is done here at the bottom, it trickles up through the agency, and then it hits this wall or this, this ceiling because the political people say, huh, you're telling me that your research is showing you that X, Y, and Z is, is either got 
negative consequences for people's health or the environment. Well, if we decide that we're going to ban something, that's going to affect the company that I worked for like six months ago or that I plan to work for again in six months. So the political the revolving door, as it's known, between the, the companies and the industry happens above the glass ceiling. It happens at the political appointment level. The scientists out there are uh, really in a very difficult position because even they, when they do good work, it can't penetrate and, and get out through the political level, which is to say it also doesn't trickle out to us because if it doesn't get out in the agency, it's not going to get out to the public. So the book, The Poison, uh, Poison Spring, that I was mentioning earlier, has information in there like this. Uh, in the seven years between 97 and 2004, industry paid for 10,000 retreats and conferences for EPA officials in places like Australia, China, Atlantic City, and Las Vegas. So in the most literal sense, this is industry and regulators hanging out, which, you know, I'm sure is fine. I mean, I'm sure it makes relationships very cozy. But it doesn't necessarily make for the most kind of publicly, uh, public health-minded uh, regulation of these companies. How many acres across the South and Midwest are planted with GMO crops? 170 million. You've heard a lot about this. I apologize if this is repetitive for you, but Roundup Ready Seeds is also available, or Roundup, the, the chemical glyphosate is also available in your hardware store. You see people, I see people almost every day uh, with their little hand squirters squirting Roundup all over the place. Uh, Agent Orange, as you, many people remember from uh, Vietnam, one of its constituents is 2,4-D, uh, very common, popular herbicide, uh, also available uh, in your local hardware store and your local supermarket. And until recently, I, I teach at the University of Delaware, and they were using 2,4-D all over our campus, and then my, I told my environmental journalism students about it, they wrote about it, and it caused such a flap that uh, the grounds crew had to decide to use something else. It was kind of a rare moment of um, political pressure rising from my students. It was very interesting, actually. 